This is Audible. Recorded Books presents an unabridged recording of Hell is Empty by Craig Johnson. Narrated by George Guidel and directed by Abigail McHugh. The author begins with two epigraphs. The first is a quote from The Tempest, Act One, Scene Two, by William Shakespeare. Hell is empty, and all the devils are here. The next quote that opens this book is from The Inferno, Canto 3, lines 56 and 57, by Dante Alighieri. I should not have thought that death could ever have unmade so many. And now, hell is empty. Chapter 1 didn't your mother ever tell you not to quit your mouth full? I tried to focus on one of my favorite skies, the silver dollar one with the peach-colored banding that seriates into a paler, frosty blue the old-timers said was an omen of bad times ahead, as I stuffed a third of a bacon cheeseburger into Marcel Pop's mouth in an attempt to silence the most recent of his promises that he was indeed going to kill me. At last count, he'd made this statement twenty-seven times to me, eight to other members of the Absaroka County Sheriff's Department, and seventeen to Santiago Sancho Sizer Vittoria, who was dragging a few French fries through his ketchup as his eyes stayed trained on a paperback in his left hand. I looked at Sancho. That was twenty-eight. The sun reflected through the western window and struck my face like a ray gun. I was tempted to close my eyes and soak in the warmth of the early afternoon, but I couldn't afford the luxury. I hadn't a lot of silverware at the table, and Marcel Pop was manacled, but I still warned him that if he bit either Sancho or me, he'd go without food. The Basco tilted his head from the book. Do dirty looks count? Pop glanced at Santiago, who was watching the other two convicts quietly eating their lunches, and we could only guess what his words would have been as he chewed. No. I placed the rest of the convict's burger on his plate and looked back out the window as the sunshine took another dying shot at my face. Sancho and I had been amusing ourselves by keeping score, and even though the Basco was down by eleven, he had made a fourth-quarter comeback with the tirade he'd received as we'd unloaded the transported prisoners at South Fork Lodge in the heart of the Bighorn Mountains. The Basco had apologized for handling Marcel's head into the top of the door while getting him out of the vehicle. I still wasn't sure if it had been entirely innocent. I glanced at Santiago and then risked closing my eyes for just a second. Even with present company, I had enjoyed my own Absaroka burger and fries. South Fork was my favorite of the lodges, with the best menu and a river stone fireplace in the dining room that owners Holly and Wayne Jones kept roaring when the temperature was under fifty degrees. It was a year-round, full-service lodge, nestled away in one of the south-side canyons, with snowmobiling, cross-country skiing, horseback riding, trout fishing, and hunting in season. It was early May, and the summer crowds hadn't arrived yet. With the outside temperature in the high thirties, not including wind chill, I was afraid we still had a few shots of winter left. Despite the weather, there was a comfortable, close quality to the lodge, and I fantasized about reserving one of the rustic cabins by the partially ice-covered creek and calling Victoria Moretti, another of my deputies, to see what she was up to this weekend. Vic had just bought a house, and she'd invited me and my best friend, Henry Standing Bear, over for dinner tonight. I was still thinking about the cabin when Pop spoke again. I'm going to kill every single one of you motherfuckers. It was a general statement, but he'd been looking at me. Twenty-nine. Currently, Marcel wasn't a happy camper. I hadn't released either him or the other two murderers from their traveling chains in order to eat. Marcel had already killed two Winnemucca, Nevada City policemen and a South Dakota highway patrolman in an attempt to escape a year back. That and his limited vocabulary had endeared him to the entire Absaroka County staff. We would be just as happy to be rid of him when we met up with the Bighorn and Washakie County's Sheriff's Departments, the FBI, and the Ameritrans van near Meadowlark Lodge in less than an hour. Ameritrans was a private firm that contracted with law enforcement to transport prisoners, but they had no contract with us. I didn't like the fact 
that they had a record high percentage of SKPs and wouldn't allow them in my jurisdiction, so we'd made a little jaunt into the mountains this afternoon with the prisoners. I'd asked the FBI agent in charge over the phone what all this was about, but had been told that the details would be made clear when we delivered the convicts to the multi-agency task force that awaited us a little farther up the road. I didn't like his answer, but for now, that was my problem. I glanced at Renault's shade, the prisoner who worried me most, the one who continued to look at his plate as he chewed. I didn't know why the crow-adopted Canadian Indian was being transported, but would be just as glad when it was no longer my responsibility. He hardly ever spoke, but in my estimation it was the quiet ones you really had to worry about. I'd been distracted by my thoughts for only a second, but when I paid attention again, his pale eyes were studying me from under the dark hair. He had this unnerving ability that whenever you refocused your eyes on him, he was there with you, like a cat in a cage. I'm going to kill you, you little Basque prick. I'm going to kill you, big bossy. I'm going to fucking kill all of you. I picked up the rest of the burger and pushed another third into Marcel's mouth. Sancho stuffed the paper back under his arm, looked at the stack of books at his elbow, and smiled a wayward electric smile that made the women in the county give him that second look, or even a third. That was a triple. Almost an in-the-park home run. I frowned at him. That was one for you, one for me, and a general score we can share. Come on! I tallied it up. Thirty to nineteen. He sighed and resumed reading Dante's Inferno as I reached over and slid Les Miserables off the top of the book to reveal Les Trois Mousquetaires, both in the original French. The Basco, regretting a stint in higher education, devoted almost exclusively to criminal justice, was attempting to fill in some of the literary gaps. We had all made lists for him, including Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee from Henry, and, of all things, Concrete Charlie, the story of Philadelphia football legend Chuck Bednarik from Vic. But my dispatcher Ruby's list, which included Crime and Punishment and the Pilgrim's Progress, as well as the Inferno, had been the most daunting. So the Basco had started with it. I, taking pity on the poor kid, had included To Kill a Mockingbird, The Grapes of Wrath, and the aforesaid musketeers. How's it going, troop? He peeled a thumb against the sides of the prodigious paperbacks, especially Inferno. Slow. Hey, I am goddamn starving here. Pop was a monster, just the kind of owl you didn't want to meet in a dark or otherwise illuminated alley. Roughly my size, he was already in shape when he'd gone into the South Dakota Maximum Security Facility in Sioux Falls and four hours of weightlifting a day over the last year hadn't allowed him to exactly winnow away. And fucking dying of thirst, you assholes! Or improved his vocabulary. Hector Otero, the third of our terrible trio, smiled at the latest of Pop's outbursts, and I wondered what wrong turns had resulted in the scam artist killing two people on Houston's south side. The ever-smiling Latino had been shocked when Santiago had spoken to him in fluent Spanish. I'd only understood a percentage of the conversation, but the Basco had rolled his eyes afterward, putting the street hood's intelligence in question. Who wrote that, anyway? Sancho regarded the Latino with one eye. What? The gangbanger seemed actually interested, eyes like drips of crude oil flicking between Sancho and me. That book, that Dante's Inferno, who wrote that? The Basco and I traded a look and I waited to see how my deputy was going to play it. Hector, do you know who's buried in Grant's tomb? Nope. Sizer Vittoria went back to his Penguin Classic. Didn't think so. Just be glad we're letting you eat at the big person table. Otero, aware that he was being made the butt of a joke, clicked his eyes to me so I'd know that he wasn't up to anything, and then raised in his chair just enough to see the other titles in Sizer Vittoria's pile. Yeah, well... At least I'm not reading a book by Alexander Domas. Hector was grinning when Reynaud's shade sucked the air out of the room. Shut up, Hector. If anybody had ever said that to Hector Otero in the outside world, they might have gotten more than a couple of ounces of lead in response, but not shade. The smaller man looked at the Indian, but said nothing. When I looked at shade, he was staring at me again. 
His features were flat. His nose spread across his face like a battering ram had been used one time too many. The bones of his brow and cheeks prominent. He was an average height, but his chest, shoulders, and bull neck let you know that if something were to start, Reynaud's shade would get his share. You wouldn't have thought him capable at twenty-seven of the rap sheet he carried, but when you looked into his outlandish eyes, it was all there. His irises were the same washed-out blue as the winter Wyoming sky, and just as cold. At least one was. Reno's left eye was a replacement, and whoever had done the work had failed to capture the exact color. The shade, no pun intended, was an elusive one reflecting an altitude where humanity couldn't survive. I'd read about him. He must have been the one the feds were really interested in. He was on the express back to Draper, Utah, to either a lethal injection or a firing squad, which meant that he was a dead man walking. And, as long as he walked in my county, he would walk in chains. He looked at me through the hood his dark hair formed, and spoke in an empty, halting voice, Thank you. It was the sixth time he'd communicated since we'd been responsible for him, coming up on seventy-two hours. Four? His eyes stayed with mine for a second. It was as if he was half paying attention, then panned around the café like a searchlight, for allowing us to eat in a restaurant. He smiled as though he didn't know how, and I figured it was the only one he had, the one with a lot of teeth and no warmth. I imagine this would be my last time to do something normal. He spoke in the cadence of the Yukon Territory where he'd been born, and his voice carried, one of those you could hear from a hundred feet away even when he was whispering. His eye went back to his plate, and his hair fell forward, again covering his face. I gotta go to the John. I studied him. In a minute. He nodded and raised his cuffed hands, putting the fingertips on the table at its edge, his thumbs underneath. I watched as the fingers bent backward with the pressure of his grip. Me too, I gotta take a fucking piss. Pop made a clicking noise as he spoke, and I could tell he was thinking of spitting again. He'd spit on Sancho as we were unloading him, at which point I'd grabbed him by the back of the neck and pulled his face in close to mine, making it clear that if he spat again, he'd go lunch. My fingerprints were still on his neck. I was feeling bad about that. I've been here before. I turned back to Shade. Excuse me? First kill outside of my family. He said it like they didn't count. I gave one of his bones to two other men who sent it back to me in the mail. In an attempt to get some money I have put away. That's why they're meeting us. He had finished his meal and carefully pushed his plate back a couple of inches, his thumbs still under the table, his hair still covering his face. There is an FBI psychologist that I've been seeing. Her name is Faf. I told her about where the body is buried. He was suddenly silent, aware that everyone had been listening to him, but then stared directly at me. I just thought you might be curious. The waitress interrupted the lake through and squelched my hopes of extending Shade's confession. Would you like some more coffee, Sheriff? It took me a second to come back. Shade's dead eye was like that. It drew you into the cold. Yes, ma'am. I caught her looking at the convicts and figured it was to be expected. If they're lucky, most people in the private sector never get to meet someone like Marcel Pop, Hector Otero, or especially Renault Shade. But with our little road show of recidivism, prurient curiosity was to be expected. She poured in a distress.